Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Moyer, author of Win Again, speaker, career coach, and business advisor. And I help athletes, executives, and entrepreneurs reach their fullest potential. What you're going to be hearing in every single episode are conversations with athletes and other sports-related influencers. And we'll be offering you the insight that you need to succeed in life, including advice that will let you jump past your competition, whether it be for a great new job or taking your business to a much, much higher level. Make sure to connect with me on social media at Mark Moyer Coach and go to my website, markmoyer.com, to get access to the tips and strategies that my coaching clients get directly. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email to mark at markmoyer.com and I'll get you going right away. Thanks for joining me today. It's going to be an awesome episode. Now, are you ready to make your mark? Let's do this. Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm broadcasting to you live from New York City. And I'm thrilled you're listening, whether you're here in New York, anywhere else in the United States or on this planet. Thanks for being here. And I'm in a super good mood because I just finished a conversation with Garrett Clue. And Garrett's a very good friend of mine, just an accomplished individual. He's done so many things. He's an Olympian and he competed in Greece, which is really cool. He's been a world champion in his sport. And more importantly, he's, well, let's just say we share a huddle. And you'll learn a lot more about that. But before we get to that, make sure you subscribe to this podcast, whether you're listening to it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Uh, YouTube, wherever you're listening to it. Thanks for being here and make sure to subscribe. Also, go on to markmoyer.com to catch all the previous episodes. They're all fantastic guests and you're going to get a lot from those. And take a look on the website for great content as it pertains to really increasing your business or your career in a variety of ways. But let's just jump right into the episode with Garrett. Super guy. We had a lot of laughs. He's he's, he's really a a great guest. You're going to love it. Happy listening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. My name is Mark Moyer, and I'm super thrilled to have Garrett Clue on board today. Uh, I've known Garrett for a couple of years now, super guy, good friend of mine, and not only an Olympian, but more importantly, just kicking butt and taking names post-Olympics. And we're going to talk about a lot of that, along with his current endeavor, which I'm a big fan of. So say hello, Garrett. Hello, Mark. How are you? Thank you for having me on. That was a generous, kind and generous introduction. Um, yes. Appreciate I have it. to be kind. I'll be kinder and gentler or something. <laughs> but anyway, one of the things I want to cover today is your work with what, what's called and what you've called the huddle, which is a super cool um, sort of get together of some might say a variety of experts in the sports industry to assess a couple of different sports um, endeavors. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I want to talk a little bit about Garrett and his life story because it's just so darn fascinating. Wow. And, and um, Garrett has been, has been enduring me calling him my, you know, he's, I've been telling him he's my favorite athlete. Um, and I'm not sure why I do that anymore because I don't think I need to suck up to him anymore. Maybe I do. But anyway, Garrett, let's, take, let's hit the rewind button quite a few years. I know that you were born and raised in LA, which uh, which is remarkable that anybody really stays there long because of all the fires and the natural disasters, all kinds of things. But I guess there's uh, are there, what are the benefits of growing up in LA? On, well, on days like today, all I have to do is look out the window when it's, it's snowing here in New York. Um, beyond beyond the weather, obviously, um, no LA was a great place, and, and and I split time between San Diego actually and LA as a child. Um, and actually went to high school in Seattle. So bouncing around the West Coast, um, and probably the most meaningful event in my life occurred in 1984 um, when the Olympics were there. And I was nine years old, and uh, you didn't really see this part of the conversation, but I'm just going to roll with it. Um, at nine years old, uh, you know, you don't really know what the Olympics are. It was the very first time I'd sort of been conscious enough to be exposed and to understand that something really unique was happening in the city. Uh, and uh, literally a block from where we lived in Santa Monica, um, the, the torch ran by. And then on the last day of the games, the marathon ran by the house. No kidding. Wow. For real. And, and, you know, I remember going up to the side to see the torch run by with my, with my older brother and my, my, my stepbrother. And, you know, quite honestly, like, we don't, know, we don't know anything about torches. We don't know about the Olympics. All we heard was that they were giving away free M&Ms. 
like M and M's was a sponsor of the thing. They were like, "We're going to go get some free M and M's," and you know, the torch goes by, and it's all these people are cheering, and it's like all this spirit, and like you're sort of overcome with it as a at nine years old. Um, and then we went back, uh, and I, I remember I can visual like I can remember seeing um, Joan Benoit on her way to victory on the women's marathon, um, and that was something that like at that moment sort of changed like the trajectory of my life forever, just being that close to the games. And I said, you know, one day I'm going to do this, you know, and I, like, you know, you don't really know what this is or what it takes or anything, but, um, it was, it was meaningful enough that, uh, it, it made that kind of an impression. Wow. That's great. Well, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of uh, a, f- a previous guest of mine, Ruben Gonzalez, and he said the same thing, but he's, he's a little bit older and he was watching the 1980, uh, the hockey team, uh, when at Lake Placid. And he said the same thing. He said, one day I'm going to be an Olympian. And his story is, uh, goes a different bit of a direction, but it's the same sort of thing. Once you catch that spirit, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, get rid of it. Uh, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell you, Garrett, whether you like it or not. Uh, I was also very inspired. I'm, I'm a big winter Olympics fan, more so than summer, sorry to tell you. But I used to watch all the skiing events and say, God, I really want to be, I would love to compete. And I was a decent skier, but not, nothing great. But my mother was born and raised in Egypt. So I figured for a long time when I was like a teen, I said, gee, you know, I could be like the Egyptian ski team, right? The I, whole team. You could be the entire team. <laughs> pretty confident I'd be the one marching with the Egyptian flag or whatever and in the at the Winter Olympics. So I was pretty far. I was thinking, wow, that'd be really cool to do that. But that's where it sort of ended. I, well, <laughs> we, we actually had that in common because the very first sport that I intended on competing in the Olympics was downhill skiing. No kidding. So wow. I don't know if you... I don't, you, you, I don't know if I had told you that before. So uh, I had been watching the Mayer brothers. So Phil and Steve Mayer were like these two downhill guys that were awesome. And like, and I was a pretty good skier, but I was living in LA, like, you know, and we were, we did not have a lot of money and skiing is, you know, a very, it's a, it's a like, it's a pretty expensive sport. Um, and my family was not about to move to the mountains so that I could pursue some crazy dream of, be, you know, becoming a downhill skier in the Olympics. But that was the first plan. Like that was, you know, and, Ultimately, like I was, I was a ski instructor in high school. I, I was pretty good at, you know, I was like pretty good at skiing, but you know, that was like a, a sort of a total fluke, but um, that was the original idea. Well, and what's interesting is that most people don't realize though, that just about what, an hour and 45, two hours from LA is Mount Baldy and some other significant mountains that you can ski in. And people always think of LA as the palm trees and, you know, Hollywood Boulevard and so forth. So uh, that, that's a, that's a great story. So you, you go to high school, Seattle, you're all over the West coast and then you, what was it? What was the day, you know, what, what made you start doing the rowing thing? Yeah. Um, so the next sport, just if we go linearly from downhill skiing, you know, the next sport was going to be volleyball. Cause that, that's like a cool thing to do, right? Yeah. Like okay. volleyball players are like cool and, you know, and by the way, like I should preface this by saying, you know, I was the kid in PE that like wasn't coordinated enough to do jumping jacks. Like, you know how there's always that one kid that can't figure out where the legs and the arms go? Like, that was me. Um, what I didn't know uh, was that I was capable of producing like a significant amount of power. But as a kid, you don't really know that. Um, so I thought, okay, volleyball is the thing. Karch Karai, like Eric, like all these guys we follow that, you know. 88 Olympics, you know, like it was a, that was going to be the thing. So I started, I really started playing volleyball in Seattle and I thought like, God, I'm pretty good at this volleyball thing. I was playing on the beach, you know, and I could actually jump. I mean, I was, you know, I had like a 30 something inch vertical, which, you know, surprised everybody. And I ended up going to San Diego state as like a quasi recruit. I thought, this is it. You know, this is the path. I can see it visual, like the vision of being, you know, I'm going to play volleyball at San Diego State for four years and I'm going to the Olympics, maybe 1996, you know, but if not 96, like 2000, like that, right. it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. So I go, like I'm a freshman at San Diego State, 17 years old, go to the volleyball tryouts and like I'm cut in like the first week. <laughs> like absolutely gutted, right? So my, my like Olympic dream is like, you know, comes like screeching to a halt. Right. And I'm, and I'm I, like, I can remember, I remember that, that moment of feeling like 
there's no reason like I, this is just a stupid like this is a dumb thing to even be doing and i you know like i don't even feel like any purpose anymore and at san diego state rowing is not a it's not it's not a you know athletic department sport it's a you know club sport yeah. and when i first got there they tried to recruit me on campus and i said no 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 i'm a volleyball player i said okay okay so in like a couple of weeks later the coach called back and he got all the cuts. He knew everybody that got cut. And he said, are you still a volleyball player? I said, God damn it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. And he said, well, listen, just come out and try it. And so what I, my, my thought was, okay, I got to do something to stay in shape for the next volleyball tryout. Right? <laughs> and, I, and I like, that's how, that's how like twisted I was. And I thought, God, I heard this rowing thing. Cause I was in Seattle. Rowing is kind of a big deal up there. I said, I heard this rowing thing is pretty difficult. So like, if nothing else, I'll be in like the best shape of my life come the next volleyball tryout, which if you think about it is like just ridiculous. Like you're not going to get better at volleyball by rowing. That's just, that, that doesn't make any sense, but sounded good at the time (laughs) at the time, you know, so on November, like 11th, I started, that was my first rowing practice. And this is the part of the story where everyone expects it. Oh God, you must've been a natural. And like, you just took to it. And it was like this magical thing. I was terrible. I mean, I was really bad. Um, and ev- by the way, everyone else, all the other novices had started like weeks before. So I was behind all of them. It wasn't natural for me, but after doing it for a few months, I was like, okay, now this is it. Okay. Now I'm, I'm doubling down. This is a, you know, these guys will at least take me, right? I mean, it's a club program. They'll take anybody. Like if they just check your, check to, check to make sure you're breathing, your heart rate. Okay. Can you, can you pay the dues? You're in. Um, and that was it. And that's, I mean, most people don't wake up at, you know, when they're kids and say, you know, I dream of being a rower. It, rowing's not that cool. They dream of being a downhill skier or a volleyball player or something, you know, something fun or cool, but yeah. not, you know, not with rowing. And so, that's how I, you know, I, it's more like rowing found me than I found rowing. And that maybe sounds a little cliched when I say it out loud, but it's probably, there's probably more truth to it. Now, the interesting thing is that you were also an academic at school, I'm assuming, with a major like kinesiology, huh? What, what's that all about? I don't even know how to say that word. Is that really right? <laughs> no. Kinesi, uh, what? kinesiology which was which was just exercise physiology right um uh, for some reason i thought it was like the study of motion or something like that but i guess yeah uh, i mean that's but it's exercise physiology it's just you know um and look i will never pretend to be an academic and that's the first time anyone, anyone's ever accused me of being an academic in my life <laughs> um you know i uh practice practice rowing practice was at 5 five fifteen or five thirty every morning so you know, staying awake in class was a challenge. Um, I did, I did okay in school, but really just, just, you know, being able to show up, stay awake and and get enough, you know, studying in before you pass out at 9 PM, you know, and this is like college. This is where I'm supposed to be, you know, like going crazy and, you know, partying and doing all this stuff. It's like, I can't stay awake past like 9 30, 10, you know? Um, but I think one of the things that, that, kinesiology the degree gave me was a deep understanding of what was going on for the training you know like i really understood what was happening in my body in terms of the systems that were you know how to train the systems there was a lot of you know coaching classes there was a lot of um i mean you have anatomy and you have you know physiology and you have chemistry and some of the regular kind of pre-med stuff but um it gave me an advantage of just understanding like all the systems and how they worked and you know, that gave me a base, which I used for my entire career. Well, that's, that's actually, that's great to hear because many people really never have the opportunity to use what they studied in their post collegiate career. Well, don't, well, don't get me wrong. As soon as I retired, I'd never use it again. <laughs> so, so you're not using it now in your day to day No, it was surprising. I know it's a shock. You know, I was a geology minor and, and, uh, yeah, I haven't really done much drilling, uh, into bedrock in the, uh, in really not, not a few weeks anyway. So it's, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was fun at the time. It was a great, great topic. So, so you go through, you graduate school and then you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. What, I mean, what was it that 
did somebody call you and say, hey, you know, Olympics, or was it you going for it? What happened? No, I mean, to understand sort of the, the rowing landscape, you know, there are the schools that you've heard of that are really good at it. Um, there are prep schools that feed those schools, and those have rowing programs. Uh, and then every once in a while, you know, someone comes along from a school that, you know, is not one of those schools. But it's, that's the long route. You know, that's the circuitous path. Nobody came to me and said, you know, hey, we want you. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they said the exact opposite. They said, don't come. Um, I'll tell a funny story, though. So in, in 1996, I think it was like March or April, and I'm a senior, and I know that there's this uh, pre-elite training camp that's going to be in Princeton. And I try to find out, I'm calling U.S. Rowing, I'm, who's, who's going to be coaching this thing? And nobody knows, and it's too early, and I just, you know, I'm just trying to like, start to create a, a relationship with somebody so they know who I am. And I get, it, I get the number of the person that's going to be the coach, and I called and left a message. And I said, Hi, my name is Garrett Clue. Um, these are my ERG scores, and that's like the rowing machine scores. So you test 2,000 meters, and at the time, you do a 500-meter test. And I said, I'm really interested. I'm a senior at San Diego State. I'm really interested you know, in being a part of the activity this summer. And I get a call back, like, within, like, an hour. I was, like, you know, shocked. And this is the coach. And he said, like, you know, tell me what your ERG scores are again. I said, you know, 117 for 500, 60 whatever it was for, for 2,000. And he said, like, how soon can you be here? I said, oh, my God. Like, I'm it. I did it. Like, I made it. This is going to be awesome. And I said, like, well, I'm, you know, I'm finishing school, but, you know, like, this is more important. And he said, like, well, you know, when does school end? And, like, because like we're doing selection right now. And I said, like, what do you mean selection? He's like, well, we're selecting the Olympic team right now. I said, oh, God, like, <laughs> I just, like, this is unbelievable. And then he said, how much do you weigh? And I said, uh, you know, like, it was like 204 or something. And he said, what? I said, yeah, 204. He goes, I'm coaching the lightweight team at the Olympics. That's 150. And he said, when you, when you called, I thought you were lightweight. And that's why I called you back right away because those scores for a lightweight are like the best in the country. And I said, you have to get here right away. He's like, you're, if you're just a, like a regular guy, like I'm not interested, go away. Like that's it. <laughs> and so oh. I went from like, I was like elated. And then I was like immediately crushed. Did you um, say, coach, I'll lose 50 pounds tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I can be a lightweight. Lop off a leg. Um, <laughs> so that was like my first sort of exposure. And then, that summer, I was not invited to the camp, and I did something that no one does, which is I just showed up. No um, way! I just showed up. Which That's not, like a George Costanza move. Which you're not supposed to do. Um, <laughs> and I slept in the boathouse in, at Princeton. I didn't know what time practice was, and I didn't want to be late, so I slept upstairs in the boathouse at Princeton, and and I heard people coming, and it was all the guys from you know, all the schools that you, 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 you know, Princeton, Harvard, you know, University of Washington, Cal, like all the best schools. And I walked down and, you know, the coach is like, you know, has his little attendance sheet, this guy, this guy, this guy, and everyone's sitting there and I'm, I'm sitting there and he's like, who are you? I said, my name is Gary Clue. He's like, you don't belong here. I said, that's okay. I said, I'm just gonna, if you need me, I'm just gonna be here. If someone doesn't show up, like, I'll just be here. I'm just gonna sit on this bench. And, you know, he, he had some other words that, you know, aren't suitable for a podcast that, that he, you know, sort of yelled at me at that point in front of everybody. And this is like my very first sort of exposure. And that day, someone didn't show up. So I get into a boat that day. And this is for a selection for a pre-elite camp that was going to go to Belgium or something later uh -huh. that summer. And, um, you know, this is like that, whatever that adage is, 90% of life is showing up. Yeah, You know, um, in that case, it was a hundred percent because if I hadn't have done that, you know, that was another one of those moments that, you know, you, it's not about waiting for opportunity. You, you got to create opportunity sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I look back at it and I say, what an idiot I was like, who does that? You know, nobody just shows up uninvited to a camp. Like, and by the way, I, I think back now and I didn't, I did not do myself any favors. I had long hair. I, I, it was a disaster. I was a, I wore these glasses that were like this yellow tinted glasses 
I look like, you know, some like hippie throwback from California. And I don't know why I felt the need to be like different. I mean, I was already like different in so many ways. And, <laughs> and I was just a lightning rod, like for the entire time, because I, you know, I, I really did look different than everybody else. And I go back, I think back to myself and I just want to shake. Why did you have to, do, you know, why did you have to look, you know, but at, in, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I stayed, I, I competed with all those guys at the camp for a few weeks. We raced in a few things together. I got cut by the guy who made the boat. I mean, I got, I got beat by the guy who made the boat and they went on to Belgium and they won whatever it was, the under 23 race. And I felt like, okay, well, that didn't end the way I wanted it to, but, you know, I sh like I'm in the conversation. Like, this isn't just a complete, like, pipe dream. You know, this is like, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't belong, but I also don't not belong. So it was enough. It was enough to sort of keep me going. So what, uh, so you're, you're at this camp and then you, you start training more and more and more, but what are you doing to sustain yourself otherwise? Like what was the, how'd you, what kind of income did you have or how'd you sustain? Well, yourself? I had to go back to school after that. I mean, I, I got cut and I went back to San Diego and I was working in restaurants. I spent my, okay. most of my, you know, growing up working in, you know, everything from fast food to fine dining as a waiter in the back of the house, front of the house, I cooked, like, you know, I, it's just like, that was easy to do and it was easy money and it didn't right. require a ton of attention. Um, so I went back and I got a, I got a job. I, you know, I watched the Olympics on TV. Uh, I saw some of my friends competing. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then I still had some school to finish and I still wasn't, you know, I, and I, I ended up coaching. I didn't have any eligibility to row, but I ended up coaching that last year at San Diego state. And, and then I made a commitment. I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to train for two years and that's all I'm going to do. Okay. If, if in two years I can't make the national team, then I've done everything I can do and I'll be okay. Like I'll, you know, I'll sleep at night. I'll be disappointed, but you know, like, but if that's all I think about, it's all I focus on. It's all I do. Um, that felt like to me a fair sort of equation to approach, you know, and just like a framework to say, okay. And that was in June of, of 1997. And it damn near, if it didn't take two years and two months that I made my first national team after a really long and, you know, like getting cut from a bunch of stuff and losing this trial and, and, you know, showing up at the last minute again. Um, and we, en I ended up in a, in a Cox four boat, which is a four person boat with it has a Cox and shock. Um, and we won the world championship. And I was like, you know, I, I was like literally from the bottom to the top in, in a few weeks. And we we're in St. Catharines and we won the world championship by like a wide margin. And it was the most, it was like one of the most like amazing experiences that, you know, having gone through like this arc and, you know, wasn't good enough to train with the men's team. I had to train with the women's team in San Diego and they wouldn't let me, you know, like all these things that, you know, and it ended that one summer in 1999 and, and we just got the right, it was just the right group of guys. And this boat just, I mean, we were, we were setting, we were setting the world record in practice. And on the day of the race, it was a headwind. So we couldn't set the world record, but every day in practice that we were like going wow. faster than any boat had ever gone in the history of this boat. And we were like, it was like so much fun. But I'll tell you like this, this, this is like a little side story. I was still like sort of the runt of the litter. There was a guy from that had rode for Canada that was rowing for the U S he was cow. There was a guy from Dartmouth. There was a guy from Cornell. And it was like me and throughout my entire career, like I have really long legs. I have a really short torso. When I got, when I rode, it never looked right. A coach never said like, Oh, see what Garrett's doing. Do it that way. More. Yeah. It never said that. And it's never been said like I couldn't from time to time I could make boats go fast, but it never looked right. And so we're training in St. Catharines like days before the world championship. I'm like super nervous. It's my first race ever. Like there's obviously a ton riding on this and we're doing something in practice and the coach pulls me aside after practice. I vividly remember this. He says, if you row like you did today, forget about like winning. Like you're going to be in, like, we won't even be in the, we won't even, we won't even medal. 
he's like, you better, you better like, and he just, yeah, he's just yelling at me. And I think he was just nervous, but I can remember him saying like, you guys, you know, don't even think about winning. Like you're going to get like last place by a mile. If you row like the way you just rode. And I was like, God, that's like amazing pep talk. I feel really like inspired by this. Like, <laughs> so two inspired. Days, like yeah. I'm going to change the way I row, right? Two days before, right? Like that's going to, you know, it's no way. Like whatever it is, is what it is at that point. And, you know, it, like I look back at the video now and you can like see the video online and I, it looks like I'm in a different boat. Like I'm doing things that you're not supposed to do, but that thing just went. I mean, that thing just, that boat was like, it just went. And when, it, when that happens in rowing, it's like the most magical feeling when it just goes and it's easy speed. Um, and there was so much fury and there was so much anger and there was so much like just raw energy in that boat. And um, when we crossed the finish line, it was like this surreal, like it was like an exorcism. Like it felt like everything just like, I mean, it's really impossible to describe that feeling when, you know, but it was, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty intense. Well, and um, but the key thing also when you're rowing with either three others or seven others is that the whole concept that the timing has to be spot on too, though, right? I mean, you can't be out of sync at all. That's right. That's right. And, you know, I was pretty good with being in sync. Um, but if you just looked at the boat, there was always one guy that looked like he was doing something else. <laughs> I oh. mean, the oar, like the oars were good. Like the oars looked good. Like they were, you know, was doing what they're supposed to do. But, you know. Well, I mean, I'm assuming you had a cup holder with a beer in it next to it. So every <laughs> once in a while you'd stop and <laughs> take a little sip. <laughs> Boy, there were times I wish I did. I'll tell you yeah. that much. That's great. So, all right. So anyway, you're, you've, 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 um, you know, you've set the set. You didn't set the record, but you won the world championship. You're now world champion, and then you're saying, "Well, wait a minute. It's time for me to hit hit the Olympics." And you know what? How do, how does qualification work for the? Um, you know, when you're qualifying for the games, what's is it? Are you you're competing against all the other rowers, and they take the top four or the top eight or something, or is it more so that it's groups of four that that are competing against each other? All right. Yeah, it, it's. It's, it's complicated. I think the easiest way to describe it is that the larger boats are selected by the coaches and the smaller mm -hmm. boats are selected by trial. So like okay. Mark wants to go to the Olympics, like you get, you get a single, you show up at the trials. If you win, you go to the Olympics. Like that's, you know, you have to race a series of races to sort of qualify. But once right. you do right. like, um, and then the bigger boats are selected by hand by the coach and that's a pool of people. So I think in 2000, I think, I don't know, we had 60 plus guys for, you know, uh, either port or a starboard, right? So, mm. you, you know, you have six, basically six or seven seats and you've got 60 guys, like the odds are not in your favor. And everyone there has won a world championship. Everybody there is like, you know, unbelievable. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, the coach, the coach selects that boat. And I thought after 99, I thought, wow, this is a, per this is setting up perfect. You know, we win the world championship. Like next year is, uh, is the Olympics. Like I'm in the best possible place I can be you know, to set up for, for a Sydney. And, you know, that was like an intense, crazy year. Um, like there, it, it was a classic coach of a classic case of just too much talent. Um, where I think, you know, the coaches just were sort of blinded or they drowning in opportunity. It's too many combinations, too many, too many good guys. And if they had half as many people, they probably would have done significantly better, but it was like, everyone has to get into a seat and like all this jockeying and we're not, you know, there's a different coach coaching the sculling boat, which is two oars. Let's compete against him too, because we have all this talent and like create this like factions and wars and like, and it was a little bit of a mess and it ended like we, I ended in a doubles trial randomly after not making one of the selected boats and, and like we did okay, but I, you know, I didn't make the team and I was, you know, staring down the barrel of four more years, right? It was like, <clears throat> and at that point, it wasn't a decision. Like, I wasn't like, gee, do I, do I not? Like, it was 100%. I'm, uh, I'm on board for the next four years. Uh, and, you know, Athens is, that's the goal. And it's everything from here to Athens is just, you know, setting the table, doing everything I need to do, gaining the skills, not looking like a complete idiot when I row, you know, like trying to do the things <clears throat> that put me in a position, you know, to be able to compete for a seat for, for that games. So you, you, 
I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. You, you qualify, you, you make the team in Athens. So now you're an Olympian, you're there. Do, um, did you march in the opening? Did you march in the closing? And if so, what was that? What was that like? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll just, I'll preface that by saying I was the last person on the last day selected to the, Oh, nice. You know, like so that. it was not without drama and that's for another story that you and I can talk about over beers. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that was, that was the culmination of, you know, 20 years of like, you know, making the Olympic team. Right. And, and, you know, just the fact that I, I knew that I was going and I was on the Olympic team. I remember vividly driving down route one in Princeton and it was maybe 24 hours after I'd been selected to the team and the, the intensity is impossible to describe the things that happened to lead up to that. Uh -huh. But I just, I absolutely, I was driving and I absolutely just completely broke down in tears. Like I just, like, it was just a flood of emotion. I pulled to the side of the road and I just sobbed. And it was just like, and it was happy. It was sad. It was release. It was like everything. And, um, in, in that moment it became real. Like, you know, they, there's this corny saying that's sort of true. It's like once an Olympian, always an Olympian. It's like, right. it's something that never goes away. Right. And it was, a, it was another sort of, turning point in my life and you know ultimately uh we get to athens and because when you race the next day you don't march an opening ceremony because you don't want to be on your feet for five hours or whatever it right. is right um, you know you want to be you know fresh you know um and that was a little bit of a bummer <clears throat> yeah. but uh you know you're not there you're not there for a parade you know you're there to race right of course. so at the time it's not like oh gee i really want to go i mean you do want to go but it's like I'm here to race and like, this is, this is the most important thing, but we did, we did March in, in the, the closing ceremony. And, and the thing that's really neat about closing is that everybody marches in together. There's no, um, delineation, uh, right. division by country. So right. you're, you know, you're just walking arm in arm with everybody from every country and everything's over. Like all the medals are done. Like everybody win, win, lose, whatever. Like that's serious so party time. There's just, there's yeah. just this feeling of like unbelievable, like this corny, but like unbelievable, like global unity. You have 200 countries and everybody is just like arm in arm. And, you know, we did, we did really shitty. Like it was the worst result I'd ever had in an international competition. And at that moment of walking in, like all that is gone. The only thing that you feel is like the Olympic spirit and how powerful this thing is to bring the world together for two weeks. And people say like, God, you know, human beings are pretty amazing creatures. And we need to be reminded of that from time to time. And the Olympics is the thing to do that. And it's obviously not without its warts and wonders. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, unbelievable feeling to walk in um, to, to the closing ceremony. That's, that's a great story. Now, you've uh, been off and on tied in with the USOC and helping them with certain things. And I know you also helped out in Vancouver in 2010. Um, but what would you say over the last, you know, X amount of years. I mean, what, what do you see, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you've done on their behalf? And, you know, maybe we can sort of transition that into where do you think the, you know, what kind of suggestions or ideas would you have to take the, whether it's the IOC, the USOC, whoever to, to a next level, and what are some of the things that they can do? So what have you done with them? And, and you know, what would oh, you recommend? That's a lot. It is <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot, Mark. Oh, uh, by the way, you have ten seconds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I won't pretend that I have all the answers uh, to fix, you know, everything that you know. But what I can tell you is, when I retired, which actually this is this is an interesting. I think it's I think it's yeah. uh, I think it's a point that is it's important to make for athletes. So I knew that the last stroke in the Athens Olympics was my last stroke competitively. I knew the only way that I survived the last year was because I knew that there was a finite end. If I thought for a second that I was going to go on, I would have never made it. I knew that there was an end. So that's why I could endure this unbelievable thing. And, and I, in my head, I was like, yeah, I'm quitting. Like I'm going to quit. And that's just the way I thought about it. It wasn't like, I wasn't trying to be dramatic. I wasn't trying just, you know, and, and talking to friends and, you know, people that weren't connected to rowing, they said, yeah, like, what are you going to do next year? I said, I'm going to quit. I'm quitting rowing. And they said, but what are you crazy? Like, you're not quitting. Like, you're not quitting. Like, you get to say you're retiring. 
I said, God, really? I get to say that? Like, that's crazy. I'm like 29 years old. I get to say I'm retiring. They said, yeah, you can't, <laughs> you can't think of it. Like quitting has this really negative connotation to it. Right. And like, was I going out on my own terms? My own terms would have been winning an Olympic gold medal. Um, right. But, but making the Olympic team was like, you know, I was making the decision to not come back. Right. Um, and so it, I remember that moment where I was like, oh, wait, like, I, maybe, maybe it's okay to say that I'm retiring, you know, like, and that's, it is what it is. Like it was 10 years of like, whatever that was. And now I'm, I get to like move on and not feel like it's quitting. But in my mind, it was a hundred percent quitting. Like physically I could still do it. You should still do it like whatever. And I was like, you know, anyways, I just wanted to point that out because I think it's sort of relevant as the athlete approaches that transition. Which I know well, something you feel. Because, well, I'm curious because then when you did sort of retire or quit, um, what did you, what did you have lined up or did you have anything lined up or what'd you do? Well, um, I knew I needed to get away from sport. I was so burned out. I was like, I, you know, I was just so incredibly burned out and uh, the Olympics, the experience was the best and the worst like experience of my life, right? Going and doing terribly was wow. embarrassing and I didn't know what to do with it. And it was, I didn't want to tell people I was there but being at the games in Athens and, and, you know, reaching sort of the pinnacle of the sport and achieving sort of a lifelong dream was the most magical thing of all time. So those two things like are in juxtaposition of each other, like at odds, like they, it, can't, it was very difficult for those things to coexist, but I knew that I needed to get away from sport. So I, I, I packed up, moved back to San Diego and you feel like you're capable of like really amazing things. Just, just, Somebody give me something to do and watch what I do. Like, I'm going to do something amazing. Like, oh, you want me to sell medical equipment? Watch this. Like, I'll sell more medical equipment than anyone in the history of whatever this thing is. Like, you want me to do this? I'll do that. Like, and I was having some interviews and I was doing some other things and nothing felt right to me. Um, but I was like, I want to do something. And I thought, you know, giving back to the community in some way and not in like a really benevolent way, but I thought, you know, San Diego had been home to me for, for some time. Um, being a police officer, I thought, God, this is crazy. Like nobody will expect this out of me. Um, and it'll be something where I'll be forced to grow. Like it's so not who I was that I knew that it wasn't going to be a waste of time because it was going to make me learn a ton about myself and put me in positions that were going to be really uncomfortable, um, with like conflict and like all these different things. And, and so ultimately, like, I sort of applied and was like, if nothing else works out, I'll just go to the academy. And then, like, I ended up in the academy. And here I am, like, six months, maybe, like, eight months, nine months after the Olympics. I'm, like, cadet clue. Nobody knows, like, my background. I just said I worked at Home Depot because I did through the, you know, during when I was, a tra when I was training. And they said, like, you know, and I just showed up to the police academy and, and you know, became a police officer. And... And that was fascinating. It was challenging. Um, when I look back, you know, was it the absolute highest value use of my time? Like, I don't know. Like, could I have gone to business school then? Would it have been the same? Like, it's hard to reverse engineer it. But, you know, I know I learned a ton. And so it wasn't a waste of time. Um, and ultimately, you know, after, after three or four years, I just couldn't see myself, like, as a profession. You know, every day I felt like I was putting on a costume. Like today I get to play a cop. And I, by the way, tomorrow and the next day too. And it was like every day it was like, I'm putting on this, I'm putting on this costume and I'm doing this role. It's like a role that I'm doing, but I never identified as a police officer. Now, how, did the, how did the, de the police department feel though about your long hair and the yellow tinted glasses? I mean, was yeah, that? Well, th thankfully, uh, thankfully 90, I think 97 uh, was the last the year of the long, it was the long hair, right? Um, no, but it's like, it's a fascinating environment to study human behavior, you know, and there are lessons that I learned just watching people, watching, you know, understanding, you know, when people lie to you all day, every day, you start to figure out why they're lying and how they're lying. And, and mm. all these things have served me in business now where I can read people's body language. I know if you look up to the left, it means you're searching. I know if you look down to the right, it means like all these things mean certain things that you're accessing and you can't control them. It's just, there's totally, you know, beyond your control. And that's useful. Um, 
in the rest of my life. And it was good. It was good to, I felt good about the work that we did. And we, you know, we put people in jail and, you know, I was focused more on narcotics activity. And this is when, when meth was like just getting really big in San Diego. And, um, and that was fun work to do. Like it, that was a fun, I got on a fun squad and we, we did good fun work. But at the end of the day, I thought like, you know, 10 years from now, you know, I'll, you know, make Sergeant maybe. And then you yeah, know, yeah. maybe, and then I like, what, this isn't the kind of impact that I want to leave, right, right, um, you know, for right. me personally. So that's what I ended up doing. You know. Well, and then I know that you ended up drifting back towards Colorado because you spent some time. Were people calling you Professor Clue? Were you professor at school? <laughs> so I, 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 I ended up back in Colorado, uh, in Colorado Springs, and I, I taught at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. And I think this is a lesson in this is another lesson in, in just being helping when there's no uh, line of sight to something that can help you back. Right. Um, I was working in a marketing startup and the, a friend that was working at the university of Colorado, Colorado Springs said, Hey, you know, you have some interesting insight. We're hi- trying to hire some people. And like, you know, would you sit in on the interview? And I took it really seriously. I don't know why. Like I was, you know, and I was like, yeah, and so I did like tons of research and I had all this and they're, they're hiring this doctor and there's tons of like stuff to read. And I showed up really prepared and, you know, we sat through an interview and I asked questions and like the dean of the school was like impressed. And I wasn't asking for anything. And they asked me back to do it again. And, and eventually they had an opening for an adjunct professor and they said, God, you know, we were really impressed by you. Would you be interested in teaching like one or two days a week? I said, God, like, I don't know. How do you teach? What do you do? Like, <laughs> what do you like? I don't. You, sure, I. You know. And at that point, oh, then you I were was, thinking, what kind of stuff do I have to wear as a teacher? I'm going to have to get the uh, the jacket with the little the patch there, and that's right, that's right. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have to have a black, uh, you know, turtleneck. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, and, and that was that was really that was a really fun thing to do. And it's, it was one of those things that was kind of a bucket list item. Like I always wondered what it would be like to teach at a university, right? Yeah, like where, cool. there's a, where there's like adults in the room and you're like, you know, they supposedly want to be there. Uh, and I taught, you know, sports marketing. I taught like facilities and sports and stuff because I'd done a project in Vancouver at the Olympic games. And, uh, and I don't know that I was like, I, I'm sure that I was not the best teacher, but um, I, I thought that it was, it, I wasn't the worst teacher also. And I thought that I was adding value to the students in a way that I wouldn't want to be taught. Right. It wasn't didactic. It was like teaching through stories and, Mm. and really trying, you know, and I think I was probably successful some percentage of the time doing that. And the rest of it was like, (laughs) you have to take the test. Like, you know, like all the same stuff that I used to do when I was in school, like, you know, so, but it was really interesting. Like, how do you, how do you even make a test? Like, what do you, you know, I was just starting from scratch and they just threw me into a classroom and said, go, Hey everybody. Like I'm your professor question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, are you the substitute? <laughs> oh my God. That's great. I mean, look, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, all these experiences all piled into the big pot of soup though. And they made, uh, you know, where you are today because it's, you know, everything that you do, uh, brings a different and a unique perspective, you know, that you're taking from whether it's working at Home Depot and dealing with customer service issues and so forth, I'm assuming, or even being in the restaurant industry as a waiter, cook, whatever you were doing and, and all the different things, they all kind of add up. And, you know, it's the same thing when I look back at what I've done, I, I stumbled into a lot of things that I never, never expected doing. And, but you do them and then you, you hopefully, if you're smart enough, you, you pull from them. Right. And, and that's, it seems like that's what you've been doing because then you went, you, then you decided that, you know, you went and got your, your degree, your MBA and you come out and you're really smart now. You're super smart. Oh my God. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> and so I, you know, let's, let's kind of fast forward a little bit. I want to talk about, you know, your work as, uh, you know, I know you worked uh, with Star Angel for a while and, and I'm curious a little bit about that and and also with what you're doing now. But what was it that, you know, I mean, have you always steered towards the direction you're going now or was this sort of a, as a result of going to business school? So um, 
you know, I finished business school and like most business school, new, new business school grads, I thought, I'm going to go work in finance. This will be the first time I can get a stamp on my resume that says like, you can work for a big company. It shows that you know how to work and play well with others. And like, it was time in my life to sort of do that. Except for one thing. Uh, I was, I was 39 years old <laughs> and I was, I was entering the workforce in a, in a different way in New York than a 25 year old or a 27 year old or a 30, you know, even in thirties, like, no one knew what to do with me. I was wandering through all the bulge bracket firms in New York. Everyone wanted to help. They said, God, you know, we want to, like, we could really use help with our marketing department. I said, you know, don't make me a collectible. You know, don't put me on a shelf and say, like, oh, we have an Olympian here. Now go talk to the business people. I said, like, I, like, I have an MBA. Like, let's, let's do some Excel. Let's put some spreadsheets together. You know, let's, like, I don't know. Like, let's do some of that. And... <laughs> And I had, I had, I had a couple people say, listen, like I can put you in the investment banking class with like the 20, whatever year olds, mm -hmm. but, but it, it, you will hate it. And you, you, it's not going to be the thing that, you know, you, you, you won't be, it won't be the right fit. It's just none of that sort of works. So at the, at, concurrently, um, I had been really fascinated. I've always been fascinated by people that start something from nothing. Like this whole idea of entrepreneurship, right? Where it's just, I have this idea and like, it doesn't exist that I know of, or if it does, I'm going to do it better. And like, I'm going to take nothing and I'm going to build something. And that just that concept has always, I've always sort of been And since my brothers and I were, you know, selling lemonade or like trading bicycles or like doing like crazy business deals in, in Santa Monica, like we'd always sort of had that spirit. And I just dove headfirst into all things startup related in New York. And I thought, I'm going to understand what the challenges are, um, what founders face, you know, what, what, what how I could potentially add value to that conversation. And so I just started helping people for free. I said, Hey, you want someone to build a financial model? You need somebody to do this? Like, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing at bank of America. Like I can help you. And over time people said like, ah, oh, you're really good at this. You know, can we pay you? I said, yes, you, yes. I, I, I accept, I accept, <laughs> I accept cash. Cash um, credit cards. <laughs> And then, and then somebody else said, you know, Hey, I heard you do this. Can you help me? And somebody else and somebody else. And so before I knew it, that was the thing that I did. And it just, it was weird to me because it, it came, it, you know, without sounding, you know, pretentious or like it, it came pretty naturally to me and what other people couldn't see, whether it was like partnerships or strategy or business development or raising capital for me, I just, I don't know, for some reason, it, it just, it, it sort of lined up and, and it became a thing. And there was something very familiar about the story of the entrepreneur and how it parallels that of the athlete or of the elite or professional athlete, which is like, you know, the odds going in, they're ridiculously low. Um, you have this dream, this vision, and you say, damn the odds, I'm going to do this thing. Um, and it's completely rational. Just like, just like I was going to be a downhill skier, volleyball player, and a rower, like completely irrational. And something about that risk tolerance and, um, and that approach, I just felt very comfortable in that environment around founders. And look, a lot of founders shouldn't be founders. Like they don't have the constitution for it. They don't. Right. Um, but the ones that do, like, I'm, I get it. And this is part of the reason I think athletes make great founders when supported by a great, like, cast of, you know, coaches and help and other things. Um, so that led me to Star Angel Network and the, you know, helping professional athletes make early stage investment decisions around, around tech startups. And that ultimately led to, you know, you know, I was taking my consulting business and moving it forward. And then to what I'm doing now, which is managing venture for a small family office, David Falk, who's you know, one of the first super agents who represented Michael Jordan, Patrick Ewing and Dikembe and, AI and, you know, so, and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And we work very closely together and somewhere along the last five years, I also married his daughter. So that's, uh. you know, that's uh, another wrinkle that makes life interesting, but I spend half of my time managing venture for, for David and uh -huh. half my time working on what you, um, what, what you were, were talking about the huddle, uh, which you know, I'm happy to give you more sort of vision about what we're thinking there. 
Well, that yes, let's talk about that because what's interesting and, and what most people, <clears throat> um, I think most people's opinion on athletes is that they come out of sport, whatever sport they're doing, and they're all set financially and they're ready to rock and roll and they can, they can go play golf, they go do whatever it is. Um, but what few people realize is that there are, you know, 99% of athletes are not the Derek Cheaters and the Michael Jordans and so forth. And they, most of them really struggle to discover what to do once they leave their sport. They don't know. They've only known, in your case, rowing or before that, uh, you know, volleyball or whatever it was, et cetera. But you are rowing, 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 and suddenly, poof, the, the, you're, you've done your last stroke at, at the, uh, in Athens. And you're like, well, whoa, what, what do I do next? What am I qualified to do? And I think what's interesting about the work that you're doing with the huddle and a lot of the work that I'm doing is really trying to help athletes understand that they bring so much more to the table and that they have absolute skills and capabilities that a non-athlete does not necessarily have. And they, all they need is to understand it, to learn it, to get comfortable with the fact that, yes, they bring tenacity, they bring the ability to be coached, the ability to learn, the ability to pivot, the ability to be in front of the media. There's so many different things that they bring. And so the reason, a lot of the reason we're talking now is I've, I've, really gotten to enjoy what you're doing with the huddle because you're allowing a, a group of athletes and people tied in with the sports industry to take a look at some new um, new ideas that are coming forth within sports. But what what was it that, 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 you know, what made you wake up one morning and say, hmm, we should do this? You know, what, what, what started it all? Yeah, I think... Um Look, I, I, I agree with you. And, and Mark, look, I wish I had someone like you when I retired from, from rowing because, you know, I think that feeling of wandering the desert um, and not being able to translate what you can do into what you should be doing and not really understanding how to identify your passion, which is the things that you're really good at, um, th those were the things that I needed when I transitioned and I didn't have. And like, you know, I, I probably didn't use my time as efficiently as I, as I should have there, but you know, ultimately it all led me to where I am now, which is a great place. And so with the huddle, you know, I think my, my business partner, Chris Masters and I, we, we come from different worlds, have different networks, have different skills. And we were doing things individually and thought, Hey, if we do this together, we can probably like the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Right. And we thought, instead of just building sort of an advisory service, you know, like or whatever consulting thing, let's do something like, let's, let's sort of flip the model upside down and build community first with people starting with the number one rule, like the no jerk policy, people that we like. I don't know, somehow you slip through, but like, um, you know. <laughs> it's our secret. Don't tell anybody. Uh, no, and so we're, at, we're both at a point in our lives where, you know, working – and dealing with people that we like who are of, of high character and integrity um, that are generous of spirit. These are the things that were important to us to start from. And we thought if we can build this community of sports industry executives across verticals from media, venture, legal, wealth management, uh, um, broadcast, you know, and if we can start a conversation and bring that group close to innovation, then our theory was, this will add benefit to both sides of the table. So that was what, how we started the huddle. And we figured that we could get two startups with the same qualities of, you know, high integrity, um, you know, character that were open to really honest feedback and say, this is not about raising money. You're not allowed. This is not a pitch for money. This is an opportunity for you to be honest, which is very rare for a founder. They very rarely get to say, you know what, this is really hard and I don't know how I'm going to do this. And that's what they get to do at the huddle. And they get to do it in front of people that are accomplished and that have, you know, decades of experience. And it's not all a homogenous conversation where it's all venture people talking venture. This is, this is, you know, multiple uh, insights and disagreement amongst the conversation, which leads to these better, better insights and outcomes. And 
you know, after four events that we've done in the last, in 2018, um, we're ready now to sort of, like, we built the community, we've proven out that we can add value, and the next level is to now monetize that and to actually bring in opportunities to the community and to ourselves to say, look, we know we can add value, let's do this in a, in, in a business um, in which we're deeming this is like separate from the huddle, the event series huddle sports partners lives on top of that as the monetization entity. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we're going to, you know, we want to build sort of a pyramid and have it, have it be, uh, you know, a collective of people that we can, you know, cause I don't, what do I know about esports? Like maybe, maybe I want to bring in people that, you know, that have expertise in different, in different areas. And so when we come across a project that we know we can add value to, but we're missing a piece, we say, okay, this person can bring this piece, this person can bring that piece. And that's like sort of the overall vision statement. But at the end of the day, look, if I think if, if you can consistently add value, there should, there should be a way to monetize that, right? Like, right. I, I believe that. Um, and I think that we've proven that we can consistently add value. And now it's a matter of like just getting creative around how we're going to do that. But the huddle is free for everybody. I want to be clear about that. It's free for the participants. It's free for the startups. And it will always be free. That's, that's, you know, that, this is like lead gen for us. Um, well, so with that said, <clears throat> because taking a step back, what's also interesting is that when you bring the, when the huddle gets together, when, we, when we all get together to watch these, uh, these pitches effectively, um, not for money, but just in general, the sort of getting the advice and guidance from us. But what's also interesting is the notion that they're also pitching to our networks effectively. And what's great about that sort of environment is that we can all sit and listen and really think to ourselves, well, who within our networks? I mean, we because we're all fairly accomplished and we have a pretty significant network in, in a variety of space uh, within the sports industry, let's say, or even outside of it, that's a, that's a big benefit that I think a lot of times we don't necessarily know going in. And you know, that's one thing that I've noticed is that every time I've heard a presentation, I've, I'm instantly, I'm always thinking who within my network would be really intrigued to hear about this. And that's, that's, a, that's the magic of these in-person get togethers. Um, so with all that said, wh what type of like entities are you trying to pull into the huddle? What would you, what would, you know, sort of make a mini pitch if you need to or want to about, you know, who would you love to hear from? Well, I mean, as you might imagine, um, it's pretty attractive for any startup to be able to get into a room like that where, you know, the, it's the, 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 the list of startups that want to participate. We have to be very selective. Right. Um, but what we're looking for is, you know, someone, this is beyond idea stage. This is um, someone that has a product that's either like about to go to market or in market that are, they're facing some real challenges, which every startup at every, you know, turn of the road is. Um, but most importantly, it's a founder that is really wants feedback, right? And look, I, it's not a bad thing. You know, a lot of founders just want to tell their story, right? And they just, they want, they want, for you to listen to their story and, and they're, they're a hundred percent sure it's, they're on the right path and that's fine. And that kind of like passion and dedication I get, those are people aren't right for the huddle. We want guys to say like, this is, this is, I'm really struggling with this and mm -hmm. I don't know the right thing to do. Um, and, and you know, we need some guidance and, um, they have advisors and, you know, but, a lot of times advisors get into a, a pattern of, uh, uh, you know, and this is an opportunity to even be more, you know, transparent and raw and honest and say, you know, I think that that, is, that doesn't really exist. It really doesn't exist for founders. You know, that, that environment doesn't exist for founders. So the pitch is like, it has to touch sports. They have to be open to feedback. And ideally, like there's a product or a service that's close to market or in market. Um, and, and just a good person, like somebody we want to hang out with, you know, somebody that we want to help. You know, that's typically what we look for. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because it, there's a couple of other companies that I'm involved with now that I really, really didn't jump into it thinking I'd be involved with them. But the reason they pulled me in was that I was giving them honest feedback and very blunt feedback, mostly because I wasn't involved with them. And I think that sometimes 
these companies that have advisors that they hire, they're almost hiring people to yes them to death and say, oh yeah, that's a great product, great job. Great. And so I think what's happening with the huddle is it is, as you say, a very open and honest and transparent team of people that will call it like it is. And I think that's the big value. You're right. It's it's a hugely valuable service or an opportunity for a company to come in and, and hear that unfiltered feedback. So that's, that's, you know, I, I'm curious to know, um, I mean, it's going to be awesome to see where this all goes. It really is. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to the next huddle. Um, we're glad, we're glad the, to have you as part of it, Mark. You, well, you. and I especially like the, the bagels and the muffins that are there usually. Those are really good. And I've also noticed that because you have so many athletes and former athletes there, they're the ones eating all the fruits and the, you know, the nuts and the vegetables and stuff. And here I am just jamming through those muffins. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> whatever. Someone's anyway, got someone's got to eat them. <laughs> all right. Well, look, I'm going to jump into the hit your mark segment because I love doing this part to put you a little bit on. Uh, let's see how quickly you can think about a couple things. It's super easy questions, but what the heck? Um, first of all, do you have a pet right now at home? No. If you did have one other than a dog or a cat, what would you get? Other than a dog or a cat? Do, you, do I have to have one? Yeah, of course. Uh, turtle. What's the lowest maintenance animal in the history of time? What's like, it requires no maintenance on fish? No, you have a fish. Like what, a snake, you can only feed like once a week. That would be good. Like the lowest maintenance animal, whatever the lowest maintenance animal is, that's what, that's what I want. That's great. And I'm sure your wife wouldn't mind having a snake around the house. So uh, that's great. <laughs> oh, good. Um, you know, what's funny is that my wife has recently been watching on, uh, seen a couple of videos of baby goats. Oh, and yeah. that they're the funniest critters to see, man. They're right. But we kind of need a little more room than an apartment for those. And they might chew through a lot of important stuff. There you go. Anyway, but good answer. Next is, um, you've met obviously a, a, a bunch of athletes over the years for a variety of reasons, but does anybody stand out as, uh, you know, who would be your, like the most down to earth guy that you'd love to just like, like you like the idea of just hanging out with the guy having a, other than me, of course, um, but having a beer with and, and seems like the, the, the guy that's the most humble or woman uh, out there. Can you think of any? Well, I'm contractually obligated because of my employer to always answer that question with Michael Jordan. Um, but <laughs> that's great. <laughs> no, no. Um, look, I, look, I, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that change the game or that are best at what they do and that transcend sort of time and, you know, um, and, you know, like a guy like Roger Federer, I think would be I, like, I, I think it would be cool just to hang out with him. Right. He seems like he's like a pretty low key guy. I mean, he's super intense on the court, but like, he's very humble. Um, he just seems like a great guy. Like he seems like a guy. No, that's just, cheating. This is cheating. I asked you about the ones you have met. Like who would you, Oh, oh ones sorry. That, met, that wasn't clear. That was not yeah. clear. Out of all the ones you've met, like who would you call up tomorrow if you had the chance to just grab beer with him or her? Wow. I mean, that's, Putting you on the that's, spot. That's a long. That's that, that's that's a long list. You know, just last weekend we were fortunate enough to meet um, Patrick Ewing and uh, Dikembe uh, and uh, and Alonzo Mourning at the at the Georgetown game. And I'll tell you, Dikembe is maybe one of the nicest people. Like, oh great! You know, like really, just like, and he's a close family friend of my wife and and my father in law, and you know he's just like an amazing person. Like he's just an amazing guy. Like really just a, just a remarkable human being. And like, if you do like, if you just look into what he's, what he's accomplished off the basketball court, it's, it's just unbelievable. Like he's just so generous and of spirit and mind. And, and like he didn't, he's never, I've never met him before. And immediately I felt like I knew him and that, you know, I wouldn't say that we're like BFFs or anything, but like, I think like it just, a great, like just an amazing human being. And that's fresh. That's like as of yeah. like three days ago. Uh, that's great. Now those three guys you mentioned are, that's about 21 feet of human being right there. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, now, uh, out of curiosity, I mean, I'm assuming you have a boat somewhere, don't you? 
I did at one point own a single skull. I did. Did it have a name? No. So, well, if you had a boat, what would you call it? Mark, you know, it's, it's always better to have a friend that has a boat, right? Like that's, yeah, that's true. you know, like if you're talking about a yacht or like a ski boat or something, um, if I had a boat, what would I name it? Um, I think I'd name it Optimism. Ooh. What about that? Is it, can, that can you do that or does it have to be like? I think so. Whatever? I think you can name it whatever you want. I like that. I can name it Optimism because I think um, to, steal from, to steal from someone much smarter and more accomplished, only optimism is compatible with success. You can't be a pessimist. You can't think everything is going to go wrong and be successful. Right, of course, of course. Right. Wait, does David have a boat or not? No. No? He's a land guy. I appreciate that. I don't even know why I asked that question because I wouldn't, um, I mean, I think I'd have maybe a jet ski or something, maybe, but not a boat because I, I think that boat, the boat is, I mean, I mean, you were a rower. It's been the whole notion though. of being in this vast body of water is just uh, unnerving to me, I think, sometimes. So never mind. Scratch that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying. But okay. all right, last question. Gary, you've, uh, you know, we've gone through your um, 67 years of your life. It's pretty amazing. What, um, that's in Canadian years, though, so you're actually in your, you know, 30s or 40s or something. But what, um, out, of all, out of all this stuff that you've done, but, and also are doing, what, what kind of, I mean, I'll say what kind of legacy, because that's inferring you're towards the end or something, but what are you, what are you hoping to leave behind with a lot of this? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an ambitious person by nature. Um, I, I can tell you the short, without going on for, for too long here, you know, ultimately, I would like to be a part of evolving, expanding, um, improving the Olympic movement, like worldwide, right? I, and I'm not there, I'm not at the point where I want to do that, like, or that I can, or, you know, I'm in a position to do that right now. I think it's worth preserving. I think, um, you know, particularly in this, in one of the most divisive times that we've been in in a long time, just not just domestically, but globally, that we need now more than ever to come together as a planet and say, and just be reminded that human beings are pretty amazing people and are capable of inspiring us and children. And that's something that that message should always be, be told and be preserved and it has to evolve. And now we're in a position you know, I think a decade ago, it was, you know, we'll move at the pace that we move at. And now there are forces that are forcing um, yep. the movement. And, and I think it's really critical. And I'd, I'd like to be a part of that. And like, ultimately, just a guy that, that was a nice guy who helped a lot of people. Like at the end of the day, you know, um, that I'll feel, feel pretty good if I, if I accomplish, you know, either one of those, both of those things, you know, and, um, uh, the path is windy and it's never the one that you think it's going to be. But, um, over time, uh, I think if you surround yourself with good people that, you know, good things happen. What a, what a great way to end this. Garrett, appreciate your time. You've been great. The amount of advice and insight is valuable, but, uh, just as you say, being a nice guy and really trying to work with people and help people. Uh, obviously I, I appreciate that big time. So thanks again for being on the show, make your mark podcast. You've definitely shown everybody how you've made your mark. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mark. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of yours. I will be for, for a long time. Uh, you do, you do amazing work and I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be asked. So thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Appreciate the kind words. Thanks Garrett. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much for joining us today on this episode of Make Your Mark Podcast. The goal of the podcast is to help you find ways to make your mark, to succeed in life, and to jump past your competition. Be sure to leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher and subscribe to be the first to hear new episodes. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email, mark at markmoyer.com, and I'll get back to you right away. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.